Okay, we should be live on YouTube in a few minutes. We have 18 people in the wait room. I'm gonna start admitting them so they don't wonder. But Marine, feel free to tell them that we are gonna get started in just a minute as more people come in. Okay. All right, I'm gonna go quiet, Marine. So good luck. You guys are gonna be awesome. Go for it. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I think we will go ahead and get started now. So, assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Myreen Malik, and I am the leader of the Teen Pact organization. So, Teen Pact stands for Teen Pakistani American Collaborative of Texas, and here we are encouraging Pakistani American youth to become more involved in politics. So, first things first, I want to thank everyone for coming. I am so happy with the turnout that we have, and um, I'm so excited to have you all here. And Mayor Jeffrey, thank you so much for coming. I know your schedule is crazy busy and I'm so happy that you got the chance to join us today. So as I said, here at Teen Pact, we are encouraging Pakistani American youth to become more involved in politics. So um, some events that we have done in the past are phone making events and we have worked on various campaigns such as the Mike Siegel campaign. So if that's something that you would be interested in, or if you um, would like to be a part of it, I am going to put the link in the chat in just a minute. So if you're interested in joining Team Pact, you can fill that out, or you can email us, you can DM us on Instagram, or you can just text me directly at my phone number right here. We would love to have you in building a strong community of Pakistani American teenagers. So our agenda for today is right now we're just doing our intro, then we're going to let our special guest, Ms. Jeffrey, um, Mary Jeffrey, speak a little bit and tell you a little bit about herself. And then we're going to jump into our initial question segment. So me and, so Aisha and I will just be asking Mary Jeffrey some questions that we prepared beforehand. And then we're going to open the floor up to the audience so you guys can ask Mary Jeffrey some questions directly. And, I, and with that, I will turn, turn it to Aisha. Thanks, Maureen. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Aisha Rashid, and I'm the co-host of this event. I'm 14, and I also live in Austin. I'm just going to go through the expectations for all attendees. So everyone should keep their mic muted, but you are encouraged to use the chat for Q&A windows if you have any comments or questions for the speaker. There will also be an opportunity to get off mute and ask a question later on. Okay. So today we'll be welcoming activist and politician, Mayor Sadaf Jaffer as our guest speaker. In 2019, Mayor Jaffer was elected as the mayor of Montgomery Township, New Jersey, becoming the first South Asian woman to serve as mayor in New Jersey and the first Muslim woman to serve as mayor in the United States. Last year, Mayor Jaffer was successful in handling COVID-19, sustaining some of the lowest numbers of cases in New Jersey. She's also worked hard to ensure that all members of her community are able to have a say by organizing youth leadership and racial justice meetings. She has a PhD from Harvard and teaches at Princeton. And Mayor Jaffer, many Pakistani American teens, including myself, look up to you and are very excited to have you as a speaker today. So please tell us a little about yourself. Hi everyone, so nice to be here with you all. Uh, again, my name is Sadaf Jaffer and I just finished two terms as mayor of Montgomery Township, New Jersey. So I think I'll talk a little bit about my path since uh, this is a session for you know all of the youth who are joining us today. Uh, I grew up in Chicago and 
I grew up in a, you know, South Asian community. My mom was born in Pakistan and my dad was actually born in Yemen, but all of our ancestors are all South Asian. So that was kind of my, my background. And I have a six-year-old daughter now, and she finds it very funny that I spoke Urdu before I spoke English. And um, I wish I was in, as fluent in Urdu as I used to be as a child, but I still, you know, do keep up with um, the writing and, and the language and the literature. So I grew up in Chicago and, um, you know, I happened to, you know, do well in school and I luckily had a lot of support from my parents to excel in academics and also the arts. I was very much involved with theater and women's chorale and things of that nature. And I tried a bit of sports, though I can't say sports were my forte, but I did uh, play on the tennis team and was involved in those ways. And when I was a junior in high school, there was an opportunity to apply for a program called Future Leaders of Chicago. And, you know, I, I went back and forth in terms of how confident I was about doing things, but one of my teachers and mentors in the high school really encouraged me to go ahead and give it a try. And so I applied for this program and I ended up getting in. And I think that was a really important experience for me because that program was all about connecting with city government, different nonprofit organizations that work in the city and the efforts that they make to improve the community. And um, I think that was really good for me to think in terms of practical solutions for your community's problems. And um, so that was something that I participated in in high school. And um, I think coming from an immigrant background, I always felt like I was a bridge between different communities, different cultures. And so I was interested in going into diplomacy. And so when I was looking at colleges, I was very interested in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. And I was lucky enough to get into that program. So I went to Georgetown for college. And while I was in college, I you know, kept an interest in politics. I interned at the State Department. I interned with the Marine Corps. Um, I studied abroad for my junior year of college at the American University in Cairo, traveled a lot within the Middle East. And, um, but then I, I was very interested in my studies of Islamic history and Muslim societies. And some of my faculty mentors really recommended that I pursue a PhD. I didn't really know much about the PhD process or anything like that. But I applied for an undergraduate research program at UCLA that was really helpful in, in giving me some experience and background. And um, after I finished my undergraduate degree, I actually uh, went to India for two years to study Urdu at a program called the American Institute of Indian Studies that offers different language programs in different cities of India and their Urdu programs in Lucknow. There's also a Berkeley Urdu language program that's in Lahore in Pakistan. So at that time, they weren't offering it in Pakistan, they were only offering it in India. So that was a really important experience for me. To I actually ended up living in India for two years. And I think I learned a lot and I connected a lot to my heritage as a South Asian, um, as a South Asian Muslim and just understanding and learning a lot more about Urdu literature and history. And um, then I was I applied for PhD programs and I actually did my PhD in um, a program called Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. They had an Indo-Muslim culture program at Harvard University. So I moved to uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts and I did my PhD there. And as I got towards the end of my PhD, you know, everybody is kind of asking, what are you gonna do now? What are you gonna do with your PhD? Um, and, you know, I wanted to apply for academic positions and I did, um, but I also had this interest in politics and policy and wanting to see an impact in my community and not feeling like all of my elected officials really represented my values or the best interest of my community or that of the world. <laughs> like, I really feel like a lot of 
decisions that are made in terms of policy are made by elected officials from all over the country who might not just not even be very aware of what's happening in the world. Um, so I started thinking about running for office and in 2016, I was actually campaigning for someone who was running for Congress and I was asked to run for my local government. And I thought I might as well give it a try. Uh, in 2014, I actually participated in a program for women from the Democratic Party who are interested in running for office, which is called Emerge New Jersey. And that kind of taught me the nitty gritty of connecting to the state Democratic Party and the county Democratic Party and the local Democratic Party. Um, and so when I was campaigning in 2016 for someone and I was asked to run, I decided to go for it. Um, at that time, our town, um, and I know that like, different places are different. In our town, we have partisan elections. And at that time, our entire local government was all Republican. So it seemed like kind of an uphill battle to run as a Democrat, but I decided to give it a try. I did not win in 2016, but I ran again in 2017 and I won. And um, that year was really, it was really tough because I was the only one from my party. People were not necessarily so happy I was there, but it really showed me how important it was to be a seat at the table. In the first few months that I was on the local government, there was an anti-Muslim bias crime in the town where someone left pork on a Muslim family's car that happened to be Pakistani American. And the mayor at that time was not really taking it very seriously. He said, well, this is, this is stupid, but you can't really fix stupid. And unless it happens again, we don't know the motivation behind it. And luckily I was in that conversation. So I could say, you know, pork is used to target Muslims. This is definitely a case of a bias crime. This is definitely a case of targeting a uh, family because they happen to be Muslim. And that all the research shows that you can't, you have to address bias crimes even when they are symbolic, when nobody's physically getting hurt because it's the right thing to do, but also because if you don't, it just keeps escalating. So then, you know, everyone started taking it a little bit more seriously. And I started a discussion group um, that, you know, we ended up calling Montgomery Mosaic to really build connections within the community. And, um, you know, I, I got partnership with some of the institutions in town. And actually the first couple sessions that we had were held at a synagogue in town. Um, we showed screen, we screened videos um, that were part of this organization called Not In Our Town. That's all about combating prejudice and hate and building connections. So the first uh, documentary that we showed was about an anti-Black racist um, incident that happened in a town. The second one was about Islamophobia. We, so, we showed, then we started kind of moving to different locations and we had some screenings at churches, community centers. Um, and it was really, I think it kind of built a movement where people felt like there's a space for us to come together and show our values and show that we want to join together. Uh, you know, in the midst of all that, in 2018, my first, my first year on the township committee, the Democrats won two more seats in that election. And in our town, the majority, the majority votes on the township committee select their mayor. So in 2019, I was sworn in as mayor. And when I was getting ready to be sworn in is when people started saying, wait a second, has there ever been a South Asian woman mayor in New Jersey? We can't think of any. And has there ever been one in the country? And apparently there had been like one <laughs> in California, but um, you know, then they started asking, has there ever been a Muslim woman who's been a mayor in the United States? And they couldn't find any. So that kind of gained significance. I don't, when I set out to do this, I didn't think, oh, I wanna be the first to do X, Y, Z. It ended up being that way. Um, so I'm very proud to be a representational figure, to speak with people about how they can get involved locally. Um, but I also hope to see so many more people get involved so that it becomes a normal thing and it's not so remarkable. Um, so I served as mayor in 2019. That year, I would say that my biggest project was that our town is building a new municipal center and library. And that's a $35 million project. And when I started, it had already been in process, but I didn't feel as though there really was a lot of community buy-in. 
So I held a town hall, um, you know, I was sworn in in January and February, we held a town hall and got a lot of feedback. I created a um, design subcommittee that had members of the planning board, zoning board, shade tree committee, environmental commission to kind of incorporate all those changes and make sure that it was a project that the whole township could feel comfortable and proud of. And then um, that was kind of probably the biggest project that I worked in 2019. And then in 2020, again, we actually elected two more Democrats and became the entire five person committee was Democratic. And I was selected as mayor again. Um, in 2020, as you can probably all imagine, the biggest challenge was really COVID-19 and making sure that we were keeping everyone safe and informed. And the communications part of it was something that I really took seriously. And uh, we instituted a crisis, crisis communications plan. I started creating mayor's videos to keep in touch with people. And I think there was a really good positive response in the community to have all this very transparent communication about our infection levels, our fatality levels. And thankfully we were able to keep those pretty low compared to our state's averages. And the other issue was definitely racial justice. Um, you know, just like the rest of the country contending with the um, continuing impact of systemic racism and trying to understand how we could better address it as a municipality. And thankfully I had great buy-in from partners in the community and we actually held um, some sessions with members of the black community, specifically with our police department to talk about how to uh, improve communication and trust. And we also held a session with the youth activists who had organized the Black Lives Matter rally in our town to meet with the police department and the administration to ask their questions, to make sure that they felt comfortable with what our township was doing. So, you know, those were some of the things that I was definitely proudest of in the time that I was in elected office. And um, I would say for those of you who are trying to figure out what to, how to get involved, to just pick one or two causes or organizations that you could connect with. And um, that's, that's really a step in the right direction. And if you're interested in electoral politics, I would campaign for someone, find a candidate that you believe in and support them. And that's really the, the best way to learn. Um, now I'm, I actually, I decided not to seek reelection for mayor and I supported another candidate who did win the seat and she became the first black member of our township committee. So I think it's really important to have rep this representation and more and more representation and diversity in our elected officials. Um, now I am mostly focused on my teaching. I teach, uh, South Asian studies at Princeton university, and I'm currently teaching a course on South Asian American literature and film. And I also teach a course on Islam in South Asia. So I would say that my work is all about education, civic engagement, empowerment. And, um, you know, there's just various ways that I have tried to do that work. So that's kind of my, my intro remarks and I'm looking forward to the questions. Thank you so much. You know, you talked a lot about just being representing the um, minority communities and being a seat at the table. And I think that's so important that um, like as a minority, we have representation in the area where it is mostly white and our voices aren't as heard. So I'm so happy that you had that seat at the table. Um, so now we are going to jump into our initial question segment. So Aisha and I will be asking Mayor Jaffer a few questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience to ask some questions. So Mayor Jaffer, what issues are you most passionate about and why? I think that my uh, passion is really through my activism, which is all about racial justice, gender justice, economic justice, and ultimately environmental justice as well. So I wanna make sure that people have equal opportunity. I wanna make sure that we are undoing systemic racism. I wanna make sure that women and, um, and other minority communities get their voices heard uh, because I, I really think that representation is very important. Uh, and, I, and I did pursue that throughout my time as mayor um, you know, as you heard, I had an inclusive planning process for the new municipal center because I felt like it shouldn't be top down. It shouldn't just be that the mayor says, oh, I like this design. Great. Let's just go with it. 
we should get as much buy-in and participation from the community as possible because it's really their investment. It's a public's investment. So that was one example. I had multiple town halls also that first year on our planning process, how people can change things, why things happen the way they do in town. Um, I tried to get very diverse members of the different board and commissions, the appointed boards and commissions. When I became mayor, there were no women on the planning board or zoning board. And those are usually two of the most powerful boards in a local community. So I changed that, tried to get more racial and ethnic uh, representation and diversity on those boards and commissions as well. And then, um, you know, as you heard, I started this uh, discussion group to bring people together. And last year, as mayor, I also created a youth leadership council and we established an inclusion and equity committee to look at the policies, to create programming. We had programming on the black history of our region. We had programming on the Native American history of our region. So we were constantly trying to think about different ways to educate and engage the public and have their say in the decisions that were being made. So, you know, I think that a lot of times we are so focused on national and international issues. And part of it is because our media has become nationalized. So we really only hear about what's happening in Senate. We hear about what things that are happening internationally between different countries, but we neglect the local. We don't really pay as much attention to what's happening in our city or our county or even our state. And those are where a lot of the important decisions that impact your day-to-day -day life are made. And also you can implement your values at those levels as well. You don't have to be working just in national or international politics to have your values represented. So that's something that I would really, um, you know, ask you all to keep, keep in mind. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, racial, economic, and gender justice is something I know that is very important in especially the Pakistani youth community, but in just the Pakistani American community as a whole. Um, our next question is, how does your heritage as a Pakistani American affect your work? Well, I think that we all bring our position and our experiences to the roles that we play. On the one hand, it's just been um, interesting for me to see people's reaction to my leadership. Sometimes it hasn't been very positive, um, but I also think sometimes it's just been a surprise to people like, oh, hi, mayor. <laughs> and I, at first, even for me, when people started calling me mayor, I was like, oh, who are you talking to? Me? Oh, okay, that's me. Um, so I think people getting used to a different type of person in power is important. Um, I also have been approached by different communities. So when I first became mayor, a uh, the Tamil Sangam in our area approached me because they wanted us to do a resolution honoring their, hongol, their holiday of Pongal. So we did a resolution honoring them. And um, some of the other members who had been before on the committee asked me like, how come they never came before? Why did they only come now and ask you? And I said, because they probably felt more comfortable approaching me as a South Asian that I would understand a little bit and wouldn't be so confused about who they were. Um, I think definitely, as I said, that experience with the anti-Muslim bias crime, I was able to bring my background and experience to speak to that issue. Um, during COVID, I had some people let me know that the undocumented community in our town was worried about coming to the food pantry to get the food that they needed because they were worried about immigration enforcement. And I had these daily calls with all the mayors in the county and I brought this up. And some of the people were like, oh, that's not, they don't need to worry about that. There's not gonna be ice at the food pantry. We've never heard this, how come you've heard it? And actually that was the first time that I noticed that I was the only non-white mayor in the whole county. And so I said, again, I think as an immigrant from an immigrant community, people just feel maybe feel more comfortable letting me know about these issues than they would. And that has just reinforced to me how important it is to have representation because those people will feel more comfortable going to someone from their own communities. And so having a diverse elect, a body of elected officials doesn't just empower those people in those positions, but is, it empowers their entire community to feel like they have a seat at the table. So um, I think that it definitely has impacted the values that I bring and the information that I share um, and highlighted certain issues for people that they might not have thought about before. Like, okay, it's great. We definitely need to address racism, but we, we also need to address Islamophobia. Like we need to address all forms of prejudice. So 
I think that that has impacted it. I mean, to be honest, I have also faced uh, some hostility because of it, because people aren't so happy seeing people from different communities in power, or people from Muslim backgrounds in power, um, or people from South Asian backgrounds in power. So that's definitely a pressure that I've had to contend with. But again, I think that's only going to improve the more normalized it becomes. And then it won't be as noteworthy. It'll just be a par, par for the course that our community is represented. Thank you so much. Um, I know you talked a little bit about like some people had negative reactions, but I'm still so happy that you were able to make people who didn't feel as heard before, now they feel heard because you're in a position of power. I'm going to hand it over to Aisha to ask our remaining questions, and then we are going to go into our um, open floor segment. So Mayor Jaffer, what does it mean to be Pakistani American in modern times? I think it definitely just, it has to do with our heritage. We bring um, our culture, our food, our language to different things. Um, I'll give an example that uh, when, when I was making my mayor's videos, I often used to incorporate poetry. And I actually read some Urdu poetry and translated it in one of my mayor's videos. And I thought that that was important because it's just making it normal. It's, it's sharing our culture and our culture being a part of the American culture as well. And I also often used to wear South Asian clothing. Um, my second, I was sworn in as mayor twice. The first time I wore uh, like a skirt and a blazer. And the second time I wore a sari. And there are many times when I wore shawar kameez and I actually wore a Pakistani outfit when we did groundbreaking for the new municipal building. And so I felt like, especially when I needed to feel powerful and connect to like my ancestors and feel strong, I would wear uh, South Asian clothing or jewelry or something, because that's just a part of who I am. And I think that, that, again, I think that that is important because it's making it a part of and emphasizing that it is a part of the American fabric. Like this is Pakistani, this is South Asian, but it's also American. So um, it's, it's definitely just something that we bring with us that we're raised with, but it it's also that something that pe other people can gain from and they can learn from and enjoy. Um, we actually also had an interfaith iftar in 2019, which is the first time there'd been an iftar in the town because there's no masjid or mosque in the town itself. So that was really wonderful because we had um, uh, uh, Christian speakers, we had a Jewish speaker, Muslim speakers. So it was really nice to be able to have diversity represented, and then also to share something about our religious tradition with the broader community, but also just to say like, yeah, the Muslim community, we're here, we're great. <laughs> you know, we're part of the town, we're part of the community and we wanna share. And I hadn't even really thought about it, but it was the first time that a lot of people had even ever seen a Muslim prayer take place. So um, it was very powerful. Thank you. And I think it's really interesting how you like brought so much of our culture into um into your county and a lot of people like don't know anything about Islam or Pakistani so I think it is important to like normalize Pakistani clothes Pakistani culture and our next question is how would you suggest for teenagers to become more politically active I think you know picking one or two issues that you care about and maybe connecting with organizations. Like if you really care about environmental issues, connect with some environmental organizations. If you really care about animal rights, connect with that. If you really care about human rights, connect with some of those organizations. Um, and then you'll learn about advocacy initiatives that are taking place and you can participate in that. But then, as I said, I think it benefits everyone to work on political campaigns because our elected officials are the ones who make decisions for us because we've chosen them to do so. and we deserve a seat at the table. And if you work on someone's campaign, then if you have an issue that matters to you, you can reach out to that person and say, you know, I, you know, I'm really glad that you're there, but this is important for me. And also the added benefit is that when you work for campaigns, then you might consider running for yourself or you might get members of our community elected as well. And that's just a good thing uh, for everyone. So, uh, you know, I think connect with issue-based organizations, but also connect with political parties and campaigns, because ultimately, in our democracy, it's our elected officials that make all the decisions. And we want to make sure that those decisions are informed by the values that we hold dear. 
Thank you so much. And I also really agree with you on how you talked about like um, getting to issues that you're actually interested in. And I'm gonna pass it over to Myrina. Okay, so that concludes our initial question segment. Now we are going to be going into our open floor segment. So um, this is a chance that you can ask Mary Joffrey any questions that you have. I know we already have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, but if you do want to ask questions and you haven't yet, there are two ways you can do it. The preferred method is that you go to reactions and you use the raise your hand button and then um, we'll get a notification that you raise your hand that will ask you to unmute and then you can ask your question directly to Mayor Jeffrey. Or if you feel more comfortable, you can just put your question in the chat. Okay, so whoever wants to go first can just raise their hand and I'll unmute you. Please state your name and then you can ask your question. Okay, uh, Harris, I unmuted you. Hi, my name is Harris and uh, my question was, uh, were the, were, were the, discrimin the discriminatory acts in the local area one of the leading drivers to run for mayor for you? I would say yes. I would say yes. Um, you know, when I initially ran in 2016, it was during uh, the Trump campaign and that I felt there was a lot of anti-Muslim sentiment, a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment and people were worried, people were concerned. and. I actually said that in some of my documents in um, when, especially when I ran in 2017, that, you know, people are concerned with the rise of this sort of hateful rhetoric. And my opponents said, well, that's nothing. No one's worried in Montgomery. Everything's fine here. And again, that's, that's coming from a position of privilege, right? If you're not bothered or you haven't heard anything, it's probably because you're, you're privileged. Um, and those who are from minority communities absolutely are impacted by the racism and the rhetoric. And so, I did want to be that voice and I felt like we had to be as proactive as possible to build connections because people fear and hate each other when they don't understand each other. And so if we all meet and we connect and they get to know us, then they'll realize there really isn't anything to fear. You know, we're all just, we all just want the best for our communities. We're all human beings. We share a lot more than differentiates us. So um, yes, that was definitely one of the drivers in my wanting to run for office. Um, we have one question in the chat from Anaya Malik. She said, what is the hardest choice you have had to make while running for office? That's a very good question. Um, I think it's trying to decide what is best for you versus what's best for the community. Um, I think that is kind of difficult because Serving in elected office is not a very balanced thing. I will definitely say that serving as a mayor, especially during the pandemic, took a lot out of me. I had to pour my heart and soul into it to do the job that I thought the community deserves. Um, but that takes a lot out of you as an individual. So I think trying to figure that balance out, like how do I take care of myself and sustain myself and my family, but also try to help and support my community. So I think that figuring out how best to balance all those things is definitely the most difficult thing. Thank you. Okay. So we have a question in the chat from Faryal Jabbar. What did you do during your campaign to connect with people and let them know your stance? That's a really good question. So I use social media a lot. And I think that that put me over the edge as compared to my opponents who were not so adept on social media. So I, you know, had social media pages. I used to go to all the local events. This is obviously pre-COVID, um, but if there was a Girl Scouts event, a Boy Scouts event, a charity event, you know, Rotary event, I would go, I would talk to people, I would take pictures, I would post them. And so that clarified to the public, like, oh, this person, she's getting to know people. She's going to all the important organizations in town. She cares. And I think that's really what most voters want to know. Like, do you care? Are you in it for the right reasons? And um, my campaign was all about, you know, I want to vote. I want to represent my values, which are about community building and serving the best for what this, this township needs. And I had a very interesting experience where on my Facebook page for my campaign, uh, this one gentleman in response to my platform. And, you know, I did research on some of the specific issues in the community. 
said, well, politicians, they're always making promises, but they don't really care. And I replied back to him and I said, you know, sir, I don't know what you think about politicians, but especially in the local level, we're just your neighbors who are trying to do the best for the community. And I think I was expecting him to fight back and for there to be like an extended argument. And he just wrote back and he said, you know what? I never thought of it that way. Good luck to you. <laughs> um, and I, I always think of that example because I feel like it doesn't take that much. Most, some people are just gonna hate you no matter what, but most people just wanna hear like, do you care? Are you in it for the right reasons? Do you have the best interests of the community at heart? Um, and then, you know, we did some mailers um, in our community. That's a main way to get information out. We had some yard signs. Um, you, we've done ads in the newspapers. We did Facebook ads. Um, so those were kind of the publicity processes that we use. But ultimately, I do think that having a good message that's going to resonate with the community is the most important thing you need to do. I honestly haven't thought about it that way either, that the elected officials in your local level, they're just your neighbors. I um, thank you for bringing that to my attention. I didn't really think about it that way. Um, so I do encourage you. I know a lot of people are putting questions in chat, but I do encourage you if you are comfortable to raise your hand and we can unmute you and you can ask your question directly to Mayor Jeffrey. Okay, so we have a question from Zofa Girani. What is an accomplishment accomplishment as mayor that you are most proud of? I'm most proud of our response to COVID-19. Um, I, I, think, I think honestly being an immigrant, having a background in international studies meant that I was paying attention to COVID in other countries, in China, and then definitely in Italy and Iran when it first kind of left China. And so when our country was kind of floundering, didn't know what to do, there was no guidance. I was telling my staff that we need to, I think we should shut down. Like, I think we should shut down early. And the guidance that we were getting at that time was unless, the, until there's community spread, there's no need to shut down. But my argument was why wait? Why wait for community spread? We know it's coming. It's happened everywhere else. Why would we be, why would we be different? Um, so we did shut down pretty early. We shut down our building before the state shut down. And, um, and it's interesting because there were some of the other South Asian mayors also that were at the vanguard of shutting things down and imposing curfews in New Jersey. So we shut down pretty early. Um, the schools also shut down early before we had a single case in our town. And I think that's one of the reasons why we kept our infection and fatality rates low. And I will say, as the pandemic was coming, I had some sleepless nights. It was very scary to be a leader when this thing was coming towards your community and you had no idea what was gonna happen. Like how, how many people are gonna get sick? How many people are gonna die? Like what things do you need to be taking care of? What things do you need to be paying attention to? So the fact that we did as well as we did and we had high rates of participation with contact tracing and all of those um, indicators, that is to me definitely the, my proudest part about serving as mayor. That, oh. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you. And I think it is really impressive how you kept um, your cases so low in your town. A lot of um, states and cities like Austin, we weren't very careful, but I think it is very uh, good that you guys were. And I'm going to unmute you and I if you have a question. Hi, my name is Anaya. So I know when running for office, there's a lot of driving factors like fighting against racism and discrimination and wanting equality. But did you have any hesitations when deciding to run for office? Definitely, definitely. I think I think I, I kind of did it because I felt like it was a calling and it was a service to my community. It's not because I necessarily thought that I need to be an elected official, I need to be a mayor. Um, it was actually when I learned about how few women there are in politics that the United States ranks 75th in the world for women's participation in politics. And when it comes to women of color, it's far below that. And I felt like, you know, I have to be part of the solution. If I want other, other women to run, then I need to run. I can't demand other people to do things I'm not willing to do if I'm not willing to make the sacrifice. And so, um, 
it definitely, I've definitely had to think about it a lot. And, you know, my parents were kind of hesitant, especially with the Trump election and everything. They kind of felt like, is it better for us to kind of lie low as a community and not draw so much attention to ourselves? Like, are you going to be safe? And that's come up over time. But, um, but as I said, I, I saw it as a calling. I saw an opportunity. I didn't feel like my elected officials represented my values or the best interests of the community. And I thought I could do better. And that's what motivated me to step up and run. Thank you so much, Mary Joffrey. So we have a question in chat from Wali Tureen. Who was your biggest Muslim or Pakistani role model when you were running for office? So I, uh, as, as you heard, I'm a scholar of South Asian studies and I am writing a book on an Urdu writer named Isma Chugtai. And she actually, um, she lived in India for, for, for her life, but a lot of her family did migrate to Pakistan after partition. Um, and she's an Urdu writer. So I, I do think she's a part of the heritage of anyone who speaks Urdu or Muslims from South Asia. And she was so ahead of her time. She was a progressive writer. She always uh, worked for women's rights. And um, so whenever I would face a challenge, I would ask myself, like if she could be so outspoken in the 1940s, 1930s, I can do it now. You know, like there have been people who've come before us who've been activists against the British Empire, activists against all sorts of oppression. And so I really do feel like we stand on the shoulders of giants. And so that's definitely given me confidence in all of the work that I've done. That's awesome. Thank you. So um, we have a question from SHM in the chat. What is one thing you think teenagers can do to reduce the political polarization in the country today? Well, I mean, I think polarization is a problem, but it's not, I don't think that the blame lies equally on all sides, to be completely honest with you. Um, so, you know, when people say, oh, our problem is partisanship, I don't think so. I think the problem is that some parties are saying horrible things and doing horrible things. Um, so I think, I think really it's important for youth to study and learn what the political perspectives are that are out there what parties are out there, who represents their values, to kind of get clarity on that, read some party platforms, um, and then advocate for things that you believe in based on your values, not based on necessarily, you know, that your parents are from a particular political party or that a particular pol political party is dominant in your area, but just think about what values do I have and then work towards those. And if there is a party that, you know, aligns with that, then work with them. So, I don't necessarily know if it's just polarization that's the issue, but I do think that there's a lot of potential in the local. Um, it's easy. I think that a lot of the kind of really nasty uh, discourses have to do with people being able to hide behind their computer, computers, hide behind Twitter, hide behind Facebook and post things. And so when you, and it's tough right now in the pandemic, but hopefully when we get out of this, to really meet in local communities where you can all say, hey, we're neighbors. Like we have to live together. We want to live together. There's no point to, for you to hate me for whatever reason. And I'll give an example. Um, when I won in 2017, my opponent put a Facebook post saying, you know, thank you very much for all the supporters. We tried hard, but we lost. And the first comment on that Facebook post was, I was born in this country and some Indian's gonna tell me what to do. You can't fix stupid. And I remember being like, oh, well, welcome to politics. Like welcome to elected office. Um, but then another, uh, towards the end of that year, I met that man at an event in person and someone introduced me to him. And he said, he was just very respectful. He was like, oh, nice to meet you, whatever. And then when he walked away, they were like, oh, do you know who that is? He's the one who had posted that. So people cannot face to face usually behave the way that they would behind a screen. And so that's why I thought that Montgomery Mosaic and the entire not in our town model is a really good model to just get people to talk and not think in terms of labels or political ideologies, but just really, do we think that 
you know, anti-immigrant hate is okay? Do we think that anti-Black racism is okay? I don't think anybody really does in their heart, hopefully. Um, and so how do we get past this? How do we build trust? I, I think I think it has to do with conversation. I really think it has to come down to conversation and making initiatives to get to know each other. I also think that one of the big divides in our country, and it's been exacerbated by certain people for their political ends, is the divide between the urban and suburban and rural, um, where, you know, I honestly feel like suburban and rural people are made to fear cities and fear urban communities. And there isn't anything to fear, you know? Um, and so I've been trying to think about ways that we can have like exchange programs between suburban and rural communities and urban communities, or at least have classes or courts where people can take at least online classes together just to get to know each other and, and understand that we're really not that different just because I live in a city and you live in the suburbs or vice versa. So those are just some of my thoughts on the topic. Thank you so much, Mayor Jaffer. And we have some more raised hands. So I'm going to unmute Anya Hong. Um, I, uh, I had a question. Have you ever regretted any decision that you have made and how did you overcome this? Yeah, I have, I have. And I think it's, you make the decision, best decision that you can at the time. And I think that sometimes I have given, um, I've empowered certain people because I thought that they would were trustworthy and could do a particular job well, and they turned out they couldn't. Um, or, you know, I have given certain people roles and then ultimately figured out that they just weren't so good at that. So, but, you know, as I said, you make the des best decisions that you can at the time, and then you figure out where to move from there. And you can't really wallow in regret, like, oh, I should have known this was gonna turn out poorly, and why did I do this and that? Like, you can kind of think, what could I have done differently? What information should I have tried to get beforehand? But generally, I just, you know, move forward and think about how to have a better outcome in the future. Thank you so much. Um, so, here we have um, Sahir Bari. I'm going to ask you to unmute now so you can ask your question. Hi, Mayor Jafar, how are you? Good, how are you? Doing pretty good. Um, my mom has the same first name as you, <laughs> fun fact. Anyways, um, so my question is, how do I get my Desi parents to become more politically active and support my actions um, just within the community and also in general? Well, I think, on some level, our families usually love politics. Like they like watching the news, they like arguing about the news or things like that, but they maybe don't feel empowered to be a part of the process. And I think that that's the step that we can often connect them and say, hey, why don't you, if you really care about this, here's like an advocacy organization or find out what issues matter to them. Like, even if it is just, I just wanna support the Pakistani community or I just wanna support the Muslim community local government matters because there have been so many cases where local planning boards or zoning boards have made it difficult for like a mosque to be built because they say, oh, it's not the right zoning or there's gonna to be too much traffic or whatever, they put roadblocks in the way. So even if you only care about representing the Muslim community, you wanna do it in that in there. And then another example I can give is like recreation budget, budgets. Like maybe instead of building another baseball field, we need a cricket field because that's what our community likes to play. Um, and, and we also pay taxes and our investment in our community should, you know, be in the things that we do for recreation too. So these are all reasons for them to get involved locally. Um, and I also think like sometimes uh, parents don't necessarily really get what you're doing. <laughs> and I, I've definitely been in that position, like, you know, growing up. And I, I have the utmost respect for doctors and for people in the med medical profession. But growing up, definitely my parents were just like, and my community was just okay you're smart you do good in school you need to become a doctor like why would you do anything else it doesn't make sense um but i had a different path i had a different thing that i pursued and i think i kind of felt like that put me on the on the outside of the community or like i kind of didn't follow the traditional path but now the community has been so supportive of inviting me to even speak at mosques speak in different community centers so ultimately, if you follow your passions and you're, you, you are able to show that, look, I, I'm doing something meaningful, people come around even if they don't realize it right away. 
Yeah, that 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 makes so much sense. You know, I love playing cricket with my dad, and usually we just play like in our front yard. But it'd be so nice if we could have like um something where Pakistanis could come play as well, and like in an actual field. <laughs> um, so I'm going to unmute Demo Itayin right now, so you can ask your question. Hi, uh, my name is Timur. Uh, my question is, uh, so typically in the South, um, in South Asian households, there are, are certain careers that are considered, um, that are considered ideal. And a lot of people in the South Asian community often don't think about going into public service. So my question is, what prompted you to get into public service and how was it initially received by your family and your community? Sure, so, I mean, I think, yeah, as I said, it's like become a doctor. If you're not going to become a doctor, become a lawyer. Um, and my argument when I was doing a PhD, which was kind of out of the box, was I'll be a doctor of philosophy. <laughs> like, and you know, I think over time, my parents just got used to the fact that I'm very um, stubborn, and I will end up doing what I want. Like, uh, that's just my nature. And they 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 might have fought it, but now they just understand that they respect me, and they feel like I have made good decisions ultimately. So, um, you know, it wasn't everything I did wasn't necessarily received very well. Uh, you know, I decided that I wanted to go away to college. I went to Georgetown in Washington, DC. My family's in Chicago and like random people from the community would be like, why are you doing this to your parents? And you're stressing them out. And when I would come visit and go to the mosque, they would be like, oh, your mom cries every day because you're not here. So I had to deal with a lot of that. Um, and that's why sometimes now when I see how proud everyone is of me, it's a little bit surprising to me. Like, oh, you were not so much in favor of me doing these things when I was younger. Or as I said, I studied abroad in Egypt. I lived in India for two years. Like those were all kind of out of the box, different things for my community to, to see, see me do as a, as a girl, especially from the community, but people come around, you know, like everyone lives their life the way that they think is right. And all of us have the right to do that as well. Um, so I think just, I'm just very stubborn. <laughs> and so ultimately I do what I think is right. And uh, I think I've earned the respect of my community, my family, um, and they see the benefits now that it is so important to have representation. Um, and I think that a lot of our community members are realizing that now. Uh, and I was really proud to see the engagement, for example, with last year's election and how much um, there was voter registration and participation. And we just need to keep that going because, you know, it's worth it. It's worth it. We, we can do good things um, claiming that power. And I will say like, just because you wanna go into public service doesn't mean you can't go to medical school or become a doctor. You can still serve on your board of health of your local community as it's a doctor, or even if you're, if you're a lawyer, definitely you have a lot of things you can do in politics. So it's not like you have to pick, it's not either or. You know, Public service can be a part of your career, even if you do pursue another professional, professional goal. And as you know, like I'm in academia, but I'm still involved in politics. So it's not either or, you can, you can find a, a, a mix that works for you. Thank you for that. And I really think it's great how a lot of like DC parents are becoming like more open to other career choices for their kids more than just like engineering and being a doctor or a lawyer. And I think we have another question in the chat from Selma Navi. When you were younger, did you ever imagine yourself as mayor? No, no, I didn't. Um, there's a story that I tell that my dad, when we were kids, he used to hold mock presidential debates between me and my brother. My brother is like two and a half years younger than me. And I would just pummel him. And it wasn't a very fair fight, but it kind of did get me thinking in terms of, well, what are the problems in the community? How can we fix them? But definitely I never saw mayor in the cards. And the day that I was being sworn in as mayor, I, I told my husband, I was like, this is a very unexpected life milestone. I did not ever expect to be mayor, but that's the path that I ended up on. And you know, it, it's not that I had a particular position in mind, but the values of, of you know, serving the community, driving the community in the right direction, that was just a role that I could do those things in. Thank you so much. So um, Anaya Malik has a question. So Anaya, I'm going to unmute you right now. Hi, my name is Anaya. I have a second question. So I know a lot of people here are like teenagers or young adults how do you recommend teenagers or young adults 
um, deal with discrimination in schools or social settings? First of all, I'm very sorry that you do deal with that. It's not fair and it's not okay. And it shouldn't be that way. So that, I wanna say that right out of the bat, out the, out the gate. Um, I would say that you need to try to let people know, document it, you know, document all the details you can, write it down. Who said it, what time, what else was happening? Can anyone corroborate your story? And then do try to, to report it to the proper authorities. If it has, happens in school, let your administration know, let your parents know. Um, it's only by addressing these things that we'll stop them. Um, that being said, maybe nothing to change. And that's also really frustrating. And I think it's important to build solidarity. So, you know, maybe there aren't enough Muslim students in your school or Pakistani students in your school or South Asian students in your school to address just discrimination against them. But if you partner up with the black students in your school and the Latinx students in your school and just have like a coalition against discrimination, then maybe you'll be more powerful. So I would say, you know, a, document things in as much detail as possible, let people know, try to change things, and then build solidarity with other communities. Because hate and discrimination, like if it festers, it, it impacts all of us. You know, hate doesn't know any boundaries. It's not like, oh, that person only hates Muslims or that person only hates black people or that person, no. Like it all impacts our entire society and our social fabric negatively. So I think that's how, that's what I would recommend. I know it's, it's especially important to like, in, if someone does say something offensive to you, not to get angry at them, but to educate them on exactly why it's wrong and why it's offensive. Because at the end of the day, fighting fire with fire never really works. Um, so Aisha, I'm going to let you ask our finale question. So take the floor. Yeah, so our final question for you, Mayor, J Mayor uh, Jaffer, is what is your message to the Pakistani American youth? My message is that you can do anything, really. You can do anything that you set your mind to. There's a lot of opportunities out there. Um, so Aisha, I'm going to let you. Oh, I'm really excited about what you're gonna be able to do. Um, so I, I would just say, do, do, what you're, do what your passion is, pursue it. And a lot of us are here to support you along the way. So with that question, that wraps up our um, that wraps up our session today. So first things first, I want to thank everyone for coming and I want to thank everyone for your active participation. We had at top 40 people. There are, are certain careers that are considered um, that are considered ideal and a lot. Okay, so um, I don't know what happened, but uh, at top there were 40 people here, which is that's just amazing. I didn't think so many people would show up. So thank you all so much for your active participation. And I am going to put in for um, one last time, I put it in a bunch of times during the conversation, but I'm going to put in a team pack sign up form. So if you're interested in getting involved with us, I highly encourage you to, um, to fill that out. And now I'm going to put in a form for just feedback. So just tell us how your experience was at this event and how we can improve. And last but not least, thank you so much, Mayor Jaffer. You were so inspirational. You talked about um, so many amazing things and I'm so happy that you're able to join us today. Thanks for having me, good luck. Thank you. Thank you.